Come up to bus, G. 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 Come out the shop, Weezy. Come out the shop, Weezy. Come out the shop. Come out the fucking shop, bitch. Bitch. Come out the shop. What? 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lie, lie. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm pushing you. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I stop running, pussy. You just want to ask it, huh? Why is that running? I stop fucking running, pussy. No, I don't run. I stop running. Fuck this pussy. Hey, pussy, your ass won't keep. When you're carrying a knife, your fuse is that much shorter. If anybody says anything to you or looks at you in the wrong way, you're gonna react instantly. Pulled out the big fucking dagger, chopped man up, end the story, blood. I was 12 by the time I had my first knife and was gang affiliated from the age of 16. In recent years, more young black men have lost their lives to knife crime in London than at any other point over the last decade. For me, this is about a certain amount of reparation for the part that I played. It was a problem that exists today. If I can admit to my responsibility for being a part of the problem, then I have to accept that there's a possibility that I can also be a part of the cure. Like my old stomping ground, kingdom, you know, home. A lot's happened here. We had a bench, we had a shelter, we had a shop. There'll be days where there are about 30, 40 of us just out there. A scrap in a playground, a scrap after school, a scrap on the estate. I grew up in poverty, you know, I was always looking for a way of providing for myself or sourcing an income or sourcing some sort of money to maintain a certain status amongst my friends. Violence was always a part of my life. It was, it was the way I managed to express myself. You know, it was the, man, the way I managed to sort of release that pent up tension. You know, it's the way I dealt with my sort of home environment and the stresses there. You know, violence was like very natural to me. This is the second bit to a blockumentary. In 2005, while I was heavily involved in gang activity, I began to film with various crews I knew throughout London. So what's the main problems, though, with road, though? Like, I'm hearing that there's a lot of gun violence out here these days. But everyone's got heat nowadays, you get me? Hello. So what, you see yourself killing someone with this, though, G? If it comes to the point where man has to let off, man has to let off blood, you get me? That's just how it is, like, you get me? What I recorded back then shows me the legacy that our activities have left on the youth today. On our way to Kings. Uh, man, it's yeah, this is hey, South London, Battersea. It also reveals how those who should have known better turned a blind eye to how we were living. We created our own world with its own rules and its own values. Why well, ain't you man worried about getting hit by no bullets still, fam? I'm bulletproof. Once you get another fucking shootout, don't know. What's man saying, man? You know, bulletproof out here, yeah? Bulletproof, invincible. We felt invincible because the reality of life and death hadn't yet hit us. But it soon would.
and many times over. Lewis wasn't the one to go out there and make trouble, but he seemed to got more fearful as he got older. There's something going on there that he didn't feel safe about. Rihanna, find a car, I'm coming with you. Mia, follow your dad. Amara, follow your mum. Kevin, follow your girl. Okay, come. Chop, chop. Huh? Does she need a booster seat? After a conversation or on the phone, I would say, love you, bye. When he got out of the car that same day, after telling him to pull up his trousers, I said, see you later, I love you. And he said, love you too, and he put his thumb up. He just went off, he was quite happy. He was very happy. Lewis got stabbed before. He never mentioned who or why. He might have even seen the person that stabbed him. At the scene of this stabbing, at the start of this march, but what the relatives are saying is that they don't want this to be just a memorial for Lewis Elwin, but the start of a campaign to put pressure on the authorities to do something about the continuing toll of stabbing deaths in London. I've known Lewis Elwin's family my whole life. Lewis was a generation younger than me. But I had connections to his older brothers, Aaron and Byron. I believe someone out there knows what happens. They were there, the person out there, the coward out there knows what happened. There's no one been charged yet. There's someone still out there walking around knowing what they've done and justice had to be served, it's simple as. This young victim is a result of a feud that started 14 years ago involving a gang that I used to be a part of. Bless this grave and send your holy angel to watch over. The dispute originally started between two individuals. It was an argument over a girl, you know. It almost, almost caveman type, you know. These guys live by an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, so if somebody close to them is murdered, dies, they want to see that person, you know, suffer the same consequences. Because God has chosen to call our brother Lewis from this life to himself, we commit his body to the earth, for we are dust. Right, 
Yeah. Can, I, can I just ask you a question? Like, I'm not on camera. You know what it is, look? You have to be in it to understand. They are not, you can't make no one else understand it. I'd rather be judged by 12 and carry by 6. I hear you still. Yeah? I'd rather make the next man's mum pray than my mum pray. <laughs> I would say 75% of the people who attended today know exactly who, who murdered Lewis. Their attitudes, I can't even argue with because it's an attitude that I once adhered to myself. It's embedded into the psyche. It's, it's not about repercussions, what's going to happen. It's about following a code. There are things that you do and there are things that you don't do. And the ultimate law is you don't snitch, you don't give information, you do not cooperate to the, with the police. You may as well shut down shop and move out of town. Because as far as your community is concerned, you're no longer one of them. You're disowned. And if you have no choice where you live, then do you have choice about the rules that you live by? We're currently walking on the route that Lewis took after he'd been stabbed. He'd been stabbed at some point on this road. This is broad daylight, so think about it. There must have been school kids out here, people with buggies and pushchairs and kids on scooters and that, and no one saw. Uh, it's fucked up, I think. So have the authorities approached anyone that you know for information? People said, yeah, they've tried to, like, Nobody has, has obviously said anything about no, it. Not. Why not? Because snitches don't last long, niggas know. So far, like, even me talking to you now, like, you know what I'm saying? You're gonna, I'm saying something. Well, why is he saying something, do you know what I'm saying? So you're protecting people who have essentially caused you pain? I wouldn't say it's protecting them. Have you ever heard the saying, if you're not the cure, you're the disease? Yeah, of course. I've heard it plenty of times. Do you not think that's relevant? Yeah, yeah it is relevant in this case. It's relevant in, very, in a lot of cases, but a lot of people just don't speak up because obviously you do get, you do get, like, you do get your comeuppances from it. People say, yeah, you should then have to forgive and forget. No one's able to forgive and forget that. You know that, G. You're one of yours. Yeah, man, like I said. Yeah. Is the dispute that led to Lewis's murder something that you think could ever end? Well, hey, I doubt it. See what I'm saying, though? Would that, you want it to end, though? Not after that. No, no, no. Not after that. Do you worry about...? No, no worries. No worries? So what is it? Preparation? I don't even know. ready for whatever happens, mm. man. That's what it is. How real is it that something like that could happen to you? Yeah, it's real. Real, but... Life that we live in it. People don't understand it's not going to stop now. You think because someone gets locked up now it's going to change anything? No. Generations, this shit gets passed down. It's, it's young, you've got kids younger than 15, 16 out here doing stabbings and killing people. The way people throw knives, like in terms of targeting. Yeah. And it's seen as a weaker thing if you target yeah, yeah, non vital yeah. places. Yeah, well, how old are you now? 29. Exactly, back in your day, you could get someone a leg shot or a bum shot. A leg shot and a, a bum shot. A leg shot and a bum shot, and you don't get away with it now. You've got kids as young as fucking 14 running around with shank as long as their leg. Like, uh, come on. Literally, it's not a joke. But it's all protection, though, because they feel they need it. The life they live in, who they know, where they walk every day, what they do. They know that, yeah, something could come my way, but I'm going to have to deal with that. It makes me worry for the young people who are out there thinking that the way forward is carrying a knife. And I'm talking little knives, huge knives. Knives that are made for killing. The young people out there who are actually taking pride in the possession of a knife. Today, the use of knives is highly visible and has become a common sight both on the streets and throughout social media posts.
Days after the funeral of Lewis Irwin, I hear of another murder down the road in Battersea. An 18-year-old called Matthew Ketwande stabbed to death on his way home from football practice. Well going, Jay. Arriving at the scene, I find one of his friends looking on as the forensics team carry out their work. He was too nervous to speak on camera, but he told me the following. Matthew wasn't involved in gang activity. He was the only one who had always told me to stay away from that life. Matthew was killed on his front doorstep. His mother found him dying and held him until the ambulance arrived. She has no one left now. How could you do that to her mother? What sort of heart do you have? That's his doorstep. That's where his mum passes to get into her house. She can't pass there no more, you know? Imagine that. Your only child is gone. How do you wake up every morning and pass that same spot your child got killed in? Tell me. But what burns me the most is the fact that it's always a black skin and the blacks. We're meant to be brothers, but the way it's going, it's like we hate each other and I don't know why. What I've seen to realise in these situations, it's never the people who are out there as a threat. It's normally the people who are on the fringe, are on the cusp, who are outside, you know, and they're the ones who are targeted. I don't care how hard you are, on a mental level, nobody is coming back from this. Nobody is going to bed after murdering somebody without seeing that person's face when they close their eyes. When you go and take up a knife and when you go out there hunting for people and looking for people to attack, you really have to consider what the possible consequences of that will be. And if you haven't considered it before, I guarantee you, you'll be considering it afterwards. The amount of times I've been in a police cell or been in prison thinking, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I'd done something differently. That regret burns and eats you up inside. Now it's the fucking payback, innit? Now it's revenge, innit? Get me. You can just live somewhere and be a target. Other people from other areas will come to your area looking for somebody. That's, that lives around there. So you're a target, because they, they're not thinking he's not involved, they're thinking, nah, he lives here, he's one of them. For those still active on the streets, regret is an afterthought in a world where every new day is a challenge to survive. At first, it was just for safety. Maybe afterwards, it's like, yeah, you get used to that life, carrying a knife every day. You know what I mean, you feel safer out on the road with it than without it. You don't have anything on you now. Nah. Is that a no or is that a you don't want to show us? Nah, I don't want to show. But you do? Yeah, all the time. So you've been stabbed? Yeah. I got kidnapped, stabbed my hand up. Did you think you was ever going to get away from that situation? No, nah, I thought I was going to die. I was looking at my hand like, that can't be my hand. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I thought I was going to die. You, you wouldn't want to tell the police who had done it so that, you know, you could get justice? No. Nah. No, nah, that's not my... My justice would be getting him back or doing the one above, taking it that little bit further. If you have a hatred for somebody and you see them and you're getting them down, you feel happy in your heart to a point that you're making that person feel pain, that you're hurting that person, that possibly you're going to take that person's life. That's actually making you happy. Do you think 
social media plays a part in Definitely. It. 110% the social media plays the biggest part into this. Nowadays, everyone's seeing the same thing. Anyone's stabbing anyone. Anyone's getting hold of guns and shooting anyone. So they were desensitized to it and they're excited about it. This stuff looks cool. And then the more they're intrigued by it, they start to kind of base themselves on what they're watching. This stuff looks very cool to people until they're getting hit. Do you know what I mean? They don't tell you about that second when they're fighting for their life. Even if they have come back for it, they don't tell you about that. You don't see that. You've seen that. Yeah. I'm living that. Because for me, it's like, it's completely bizarre. It's alien. Because when, when we were on road, like, there were rumours, but it weren't really about, like, putting all this shit out there like that. Some people, it's just to kind of glorify that, to show you that we really are living that, like, like what we're saying. Because everybody's biggest thing now is to prove that this isn't just words. Images, messages and videos are sent to rivals, then shared to Facebook groups and Twitter accounts with the express purpose of ramping up the dispute. The results then play out in real life on the streets almost instantly. Instances of extreme violence are being normalised to the point where it's now considered entertainment. It's evident that surviving a knife attack is no longer enough to make young men think twice about their lives. Did I just see what I just think I just saw? It's now seen as a badge of honour. Young men, boys, are posting their war wounds on social media in order to cement their involvement in a lifestyle that has put them there in the first place. We used to think we were invincible. This generation wants to prove it. In some cases, the consequences of a knife wound go beyond the black and white options of survival and death. The change of quality of life can be as radical as the loss of life. That's it. Sleepy Monday morning. <laughs> you didn't want to go to school that day. This is when his, his brother was born. He's, uh, he's quiet. He's really quiet, but he's cocky. Yeah. Not to say cocky, cocky, but you know, when he says something, he doesn't say much, but when he says something, it kind of bites. So it's funny, it's loving. He cares a lot about his family. He's a really good boy, you know? He's a really, really good boy. I saw him in the morning, um, came out, they had, had some breakfast, gave him some lunch money. And I said, I'll see you, I'll see you tomorrow, because he usually comes and works on the Saturday Sundays with me. That was it. Mother phoned me about 10 past seven. Said, um, my boy's been stabbed. Just shot down to the hospital. You, you go through a hundred emotions, you know, it's hate, you want to do this, you want to do that, you want to see all right. It's a hundred and different emotions you go through, you know, and then, then it's just numbing itself for that. What kind of care is he receiving there? He's got a tracky in his throat here. So when they stabbed in his heart, it went through to his lung. <laughs> so he gets um, a lot of phlegm on his chest. So he has to have this tracky in there to release the cold from his chest. Isn't that right, Jay? You brought him 
music to listen to? Yeah, he's got music here. I've got music all the time. Yeah, what, what have you got him listening to? You haven't got him listening to your old school revival and all yeah. of that, have you? Oh, my word. What he's grown up on. Oh, just... my word. Give him something else. No, no. I can't <laughs> give him none of that. If I gave him that, he'd been here earlier. <laughs> I know this it was something that I was even thinking about sort of on my way up here. For some of these kids, mm. they don't have a father who's who, no. who, if they're in this situation, will take care of them. For sure. And if... God forbid they were ever put in this situation, who would be there to visit yeah. them? Who would be yeah. there to monitor exactly. their care? Exactly. Because it's not going to be their friends that they're out there running with and trying to protect and keeping up madness with. And if you're living a certain life, is anybody even going to care about that? If you're living a certain life and you're out of the picture, all it means is it gives an opportunity for somebody else to take your place. And that's the sad thing about these kids don't realise. They're just a, com a commodity in a chain. And as soon as they're out of the picture, they've forgotten. And there's somebody else there to take your place. So as, as much as they talk about the love, there's no love on the street. There's never been love on the street. The police can't do nothing, really. You know, it's always coming up to mop up. The, the, the community's talking about no informing. That's got to stop. That came about, no informing, was when we was under police brutality. Now, we're not under police brutality anymore. We're under black-on-black -black brutality. There's blacks and there's niggers. We've got to get the niggers out of our community so the black people in our community can carry on and prosper as we're meant to. We've got to weed them out. Yeah? We get them out of our community so the black children, black women and black men can bring something to the society, add value to the society that we live in, and show the rest of the races in society that we have something to offer. We're not just murderers, illiterate fools, consuming, consuming everything that's thrown in front of us on TV. That's what we've got to start learning. A lot of these young guys out here aren't necessarily doing it because they have that in them, but they're being coerced themselves. Things like peer pressure or yeah. somebody just yeah. making them feel comfortable within a certain situation encourages them to act, carry out these sort of acts. You know, well, a lot it, of it's initiation, isn't it? You know, how are you going to get into the game? You've got to show that you're, you're part of this, you know what I mean? They're going to let nobody in. OK, yeah, come in, yeah. No. And this is all the guns we've got, this is all the drugs we've got, this is how we move our business. You ain't coming into my situation like that. Go and kill somebody, let me have something on your ass. Now, now, yeah, you're cool now. But you can't do shit because I've got you. I've got your number. And this is what those youths are under. There's not an end game to their madness. When Jamal got stabbed in October, I think after that there was about three in the next month or so. But now, every day you're hearing someone's dying. There's about 33 stabbings every day. In London, these guys are going to kill. They're going for the heart. Before, you used to stab in your leg, stab in your arm. Now they're killing you. They're not, no, it's no joke. I want to talk to these MPs. I want to talk to these people who are making up the police, who are making these, these laws and whatever they're doing. Because if they're not doing nothing. So if this was like black children were killing white children, Oh my God, this would have been stopped ages ago. It would have been sorted out years ago. But it's not. It doesn't affect them. We don't need the BMP anymore. We don't need the National Front because the black youth are doing the job for this. It's a whole generation that is being eradicated. You know, that they, these kids are programmed to hate each other. Like they wake up in the morning, they see themselves in the mirror, they hate themselves. And when they walk down the street, they see themselves, the reflection of themselves, and they want to kill that. It's just madness what they've done. They're not even ruined their lives, they ruined my son's lives, my family's lives. What have they gained? What have they gained? What is the what's the price? What is the price after all this? Nothing. This is where we are with our youth. London's doctors have the task of stemming the damage that is caused to these young men. But they see that simply keeping them alive is not fixing the problem. Consultant trauma surgeon Dr Martin Griffiths 
has integrated a unique social aftercare system that works with young men vulnerable to street violence. We'll see in excess of 600 plus stabbings a year. And the number is increasing on a sort of month by month basis. Tragedy doesn't just wash over you. You see a young child murdered. You don't just walk home and forget about it. I'm, I've got this kid's blood in my socks when I'm washing it off at home. And I've got to explain to myself and my family what I've been doing that day. And I don't want to have to do this every single day. Yeah, of course not. I don't want to see another young person dead in my resource room. And that's, because that, that breaks me, the thought of it happening every single day, and me just being a technician and sewing up people. That would be, that, if that's my career, then I've failed. Like all good clinicians, I want to see the causes of problems and resolve those as well. I can't just fix what's in front of me now. I've got to fix the problem for the future. And that's why we, we've engaged in prevention programmes, why we've engaged in interventions for the victims of injury, to try and get them to, to recognise the consequences of these actions, to try and change their behaviours, to try and not retaliate, so they can get back to the life they want to lead. So when you've engaged with a young person, what is their initial response to what's just happened to them? It does vary, but I'd say the majority of them is what it is. When you have been a victim of violence, that is a major emotional trauma, which could ultimately catapult that young person into a spiralling negative sort of situation where they're then lost. These generations that are coming up, you know, I'm seeing increases in mental health. I recognise a long time ago, emotional trauma in our young people, in our children, has such, you know, a, a devastating ripple effect. They've normalised injury and death as part and parcel of growing up, and we've let them do that. Mm. I, I get the feeling that it's so commonplace that even when they lose a friend, they don't even know how to be sad about it. If you engage emotionally in the death of your friend, it will break you. Mm. How are you going to let yourself expose yourself to the, um, the emotional rawness of losing someone you love mm. and care about? You watch a parent, you watch a parent, you tell a parent that their child is dead and stand back. There's a noise a mother makes, you tell her that their child is dead, that goes right through you. You never forget it. Never forget it, it goes right through you. And you can, it's like a, a glass breaking, yeah? In that it shatters into a million pieces and you know no matter what you do, you can't put this together again. They're broken for life, forever. So how can a child want to enter into that situation? Mm. They have to shut the door. If you can find the output for your emotional angst, you don't feel the need to be violent. And if you understand you're in a, you're in a process that is not this therapeutic, not just preaching, not just pragmatic, but actually allows some concept of forgiveness and development and empowerment, empowering our victims to be the people they want to be, mm. there's no need to feel to resort to violence. Several weeks on from Lewis's funeral, only one arrest has been made. But no one has been charged in connection with his murder. I'm not resentful. I just thought, well, their mother must be proud. You know, to know that they've come home, hearing that on the news, and then having to point out to the child, oh, look, you're in safe, but not realising that that's their child that did this deed, and they've gone in, had their meal, had a wash, gone to bed, and they're still breathing. That's why I don't... Because his dad passed away and I lived here, I had to bring him and Rihanna here, and that was a problem. That's where all the problems started, because yeah. he's going from one area into another. So he's going from this so-called postcode of SW17 into SW18. It's just pretty much a postcode war. Like, that's literally it. It's just postcodes. Like, you go from one area to another. Like, you, do, you, don't, you don't cross paths. There's nothing really extravagant about it. It's literally, you live in that area, that's, that's who you're affiliated with. 
Some people say, why? I don't want to know why it happened. So the reason why is irrelevant to me. It just should not have happened. If I knew who did it, and I actually went out there and I saw the person, or I knew the family, I would look at them differently. I would have no respect for them. We know that we can't keep chucking names at the, at the police without evidence, but we, we expect answers, because somebody knows something. All his friends know the character of Lewis, and yet again, nobody would come forward and say anything. That's very hurtful and very sad, yeah. because they all know what went down. I think to make a solid change, Mum, mm. it can't be one parent. It has to be a community. Because parents don't really, like... I don't, I don't think parents really know. They think they know, like, a lot about the, what's children, going on, but they... They have no, no offense, idea. Mom, but... No idea. You're not wrong for not knowing. Mm. It's just, that's what No, they but I'm just you. saying, they've, they've, that's what I'm saying. They, they've always been polite to me. Yeah, well, that's, and, that's what they know, should be. Yes. So they should be. They're the same so, way I was polite to your friends growing up. These kids trust each other. Mm. But yeah, it's like they fight amongst each other and mm. police each other. It's like their own little mm. community. What my disappointment is with the friends is that if they do know something and they're withholding any information, that would be the most disappointing because I thought I knew them better than that. Because Crime Stoppers is, is anonymous as well, isn't it? Yeah, but no, Mum, right see, in situations like these, you handle it yourself. You don't go to the police. You don't just tell. You, you do it on your own. Sorry. Yeah, no. Don't you can do it. That's life. Frustrating speaking to my mum about certain things to do with like the youth and how things are now because she thinks that she has a clear understanding and I don't blame her for it because the way they show towards my mum, they're very polite and they're like, oh, hello, blah, blah, blah. So that's how she sees them, but she's a bit gullible to it. They maintain a code of silence because they can do it themselves. They don't go and tell the authority. They don't feel the need to do it because it's like, what are they going to do about it? You're going to have like a month of trying to figure out who it was. You need, you need evidence. But with them, it's like they know who done it, and we're going to sort it out today. We're going to sort it out tomorrow. This is where me and my mum differ because I would like to know why. Although it wouldn't change anything, I don't understand why someone would do that to him. I don't understand why someone would do that. Full stop. I find it interesting to find out what it is about my brother that you thought that that was okay to do. I want to see the person's face. Like, I want to know, like, you're, you're the evil person. Like, you're the evil one. We welcome to the studio the new Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Cressida Dick. There are a number of serious crimes, in particular violent crimes, uh, which are too high in London. Knife and gun crime are at levels that I don't regard Up as acceptable on knives, uh, in London. And uh, guns. I am concerned about this apparent rise uh, in the last year. I really am. I think stop and search is an extremely valuable tool. It is something which historically has caused huge concerns in some communities. We're now far more accountable. I know the officers are highly professional. They're very well trained. I think the Met is probably the best in the country, or nearly, in terms of the, the number of stops that stop and searches that result in arrest. And I think we should be proud of that. Whilst the police struggle to find an effective strategy, Members of the community have started to take matters into their own hands. Raymond blank knives, hardened Japanese steel blades, hunting knife set, made in China, hot knife cutter, wire cutter, hunting knife, lowest price, free shipping by now, hunting knife for sale, gun star. So I'm thinking, like, let's use straight common sense. Like, where did you get your knife from? Wait there, are you a blacksmith? Do you sit in a little shed making lock knives? No, you don't. Um, are you a licensed hunter? to be carrying Rambo knives around. No, you're not. Do we live in a place that consists of us needing to carry them sort of knives? No, we don't. We live in the UK and London. Like, we're talking about Harrods and Footlockers. So where, did, where are these knives coming from? In stock, dispatched from and sold by Amazon. By placing the order, you are declaring that you are 18 years of age and over. Identification may be required. It may require a signature. 
So this is the knife that I ordered yesterday. He gave me the box. Thank you. And he walked off. No signature, nothing. He never matched my signature with my driving license or my passport. I just put a line for it. Thank you. How can you get nicer for our streets if you can go online and buy them? Just like this, as easy as this. I'm gonna get my gun and shoot him, or I'm gonna stab him. That's some coward thing, yeah? Farron Alex Paul uses social media as a way to share his anti-knife messages, and his posts have gained a lot of notice. So, my beautiful four-year-old daughter said, Dad, can I go to my cousin's party? One video in particular went viral. But I said, I'm gonna come down, and I'm 16 years party. Yeah? That's what I confiscated. And if you think that's shocking, watch this one. This is what he's come to the party with. What's this? For your, for your number. All right, that's the hood way. <laughs> <laughs> Go top, go get that sick V, man. So the video, man, like, it was mind blowing. You know what it was, yeah? It's like, you see the party you night? Know? It weren't like the party was in a public place. Yeah. This was my niece's house, yeah, bro. Yeah, of course. Why of are course. you walking to my niece's house with knives? I'm saying to the man then, bruv, if I find your knives in you, bruv, yeah, I'm taking your knives with you, you're not getting it back, bruv, yeah, and you're gonna get the bad up as well. And if I know your parents, I'm following your parents, you get me, bruv? Literally, bruv. But these kids might be think they're big and bad, but they don't, they don't want their parents to know what's going on. Yeah. Their parents don't know what's going on. I let them guys understand, yeah, like, bro, I'm not searching like police officers. I'm not searching like a teacher. I'm searching like a man them that knows all the stash spots, yeah, <laughs> under your shoes, <laughs> under your soles, up in your crack. Man telling me, like, blood, man, you're feeling my balls. Who gives a shit? That's what you don't do. You don't balls your shit, innit? Yeah, I'm all exactly. in your balls. I ain't gay. But trust me, blood, if you got something up there, like Faz is going to find it, dog. If I could say to you, I know exactly what's wrong in the hood, and the people in it, and the system, I'd be lying to you, bro. Life is real out here, you know? Yeah, of There's course. people sitting out in darkness because they have no money, blood. Of course. Do you understand? <laughs> That's how I grew up, bro. It's deep, bruv. Bruv, these guys don't know, yeah, bruv, about eating fucking powdered milk. Yeah. yeah with, with water for cornflakes, yeah. blood. Do you understand? You and had don't powdered get... milk, you lot, man. Cause... You lot are bougie. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't eat water. <laughs> we, was, was it warm water? <laughs> so much obstacles in the way of a young person growing up. Yeah, Do you understand? Course. You've got older brothers, the way they act, older friends, like, and stuff they just genuinely going to see in a deprived place. Yeah, you know what I mean, course, bro? Of course. And once people learn how to make money beyond government means, and they're actually in a position where they need to make money, and that money starts to pay for electric, yeah. they start to pay mum's bills and stuff, can you really, really turn to stop? Hey, hey, that, that, hey, Josh, they're yeah, trying to get you Yeah, you're dangerous, man. You're Josh, dangerous. Hey, Josh, they're trying to get you like, whoa. <laughs> but you know what, bruv? This is like, it's beautiful. It's, it, yeah, you know, it's I so know, harmless, I know, yeah. I know. But this is where it all starts. It's all I here know. one day, do you know what I, I mean, bruv? And you go from being there, like, to being in police stations, to getting nicked, to getting into drama, and it's just like... I hear that. The streets ain't the same no more. The way people act, the things they're getting access to, the way they're doing it, it's more dangerous. I'll be damned if any little person comes and puts a time limit on, on me or my kids' life, do you understand? Over one six-week period during the making of this film, there were 14 fatal stabbings involving people under the age of 25, the highest concentration in the capital for a decade. 17, had his whole life ahead of him. Yes. 
stabbings do happen up and down the country, affecting all demographics. However, my journey this year has confirmed to me that in London, young black men are at a disproportionate risk of being the victim and the perpetrator. It really makes me sad knowing that the people that are my age are dying from knife crime. Like my little brother, he's like two years younger than me, and knowing that people in the same year as him are doing the same thing as people my age, it just makes me worry for his life and my own life as well. I believe we need to take responsibility as a community, talk to these young people and challenge them about the decisions they're making and be more honest about what we are allowing to happen to our youth. tragedy of one more young man being murdered on his way home from a knife crime rally serves as another example that this issue has a long way to go. Come on people, where's your t-shirts? Open up. Come on now, t-shirts. You know, it's all about Lewis, open up. One year ago, my brother Lewis Elwin was stabbed and killed in full daylight. Since then, no one's been charged, no one's been caught. But people were arrested. People, yeah, yeah, there were suspects arrested. But because they don't have enough evidence to hold them, then it makes it quite difficult to charge someone for something they can't prove. My end, I'm just wondering like how you guys are feeling 12 months later. To be honest, it's, it's kind of hard because there ain't no closure in this. It's very difficult. When Lewis died, yeah, I remember thinking, how can this be to my brother? So, so, so close to so home. So close to home. But then I did, I ain't gonna lie, yeah. I did my investigation. I didn't have to go far. Not far. I hear names getting brought up. Yeah. This, is, this is within a state of hours. Couple phone and calls. Couple phone calls that the same name's coming up. And this is on the street. This ain't from the police. Nah. And people are like, what do you want to do? Yeah. I'm like, let's just, just chill for it. What do you want to do? And then when, when I realised this thing's close to family, not particularly like a uh, 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 household family, but family, older generations, older generations. fathers, father's sons, yeah. Yeah. or father's father's nephews. Someone's uncle. I'm like, are you serious? Bruv, I'm telling you, it's hard. Even us dealing with it is hard because my mum don't know about all that. We're trying to say, all right, we know who did it and we know you guys probably know who did it. Can you voice your opinions? Everyone's like, boy, I don't know about talking, but I know about doing something. Say something. That's going to make a difference. If you've got information, which is hard, it's hard. But if you've got information, be bold. Like, be bold and say, do you know what? I'm going to ride for my man. How? I'm going to say something. As far as I'm concerned, there are sources of information that exist. You know, the community that these crimes happen in protect the crimes that happen by not coming forward, by not providing information. At the end of the day, it's your friend. It's your friend that's dead. It's you that's crying. Do you know what I mean? It's his mum that's crying. It's his mum you got to go and hug. Knowing, bare face you gotta go hug his mum, knowing you know who done it. Knowing that she ain't gonna get the justice she wants because everybody's lips are locked. It's a killer, man. It's a killer. Ah, it really is. It really is, man. As Sandra and the Elwin family come to the end of their first year without justice for Lewis, I think about an old friend whose unsolved murder 14 years ago made me start asking questions about the culture of not snitching and its consequences. 
At the age of 16, I was incarcerated for a robbery. Anton was one of the few people that I actually met who I could speak to. He seemed like somebody with ambition, you know, he was fresh to death. In prison, that's a difficult thing to do. You know, he had like Prada, Prada trainers on, you know, a nice little tracky and that. Like, you know, he obviously took care of himself. He was one of the people that I remembered after I left. A good few months after I, he was released, switched on the TV and it was a news report about Anton. There was something different about Anton that, for me, it actually hurt. It actually hurt. See, so this is the reality of what happens with what some people may feel is, I only wanted to injure you, or I only wanted to scare you, or whatever, you know? I think one of the hardest things for me to do at the time was to finalise, it may sound really silly, but was to finalise him actually having a headstone because then I felt like I'd have nothing left to do. And then when it finally got laid down, I thought, I felt, oh, why didn't I do this before? <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things, tending to the grave, it, it just, I don't know. There's nothing else that you can do for them but try and keep their grave clean. I come down and I wash it off, but as you can see, he's especially right by the edge as well. He gets dirty very quickly. But in the end, this is all I can do now for him, is try and keep him tidy. Because although I may not have been, he was a very tidy boy. Yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah, he was. So it's here. found wrapped around that tree, face down in the water. The fact that he hadn't come home, I just assumed maybe he'd been arrested or something again, and something just wasn't sitting right, though. And then to get that knock on the door, Mother's Day, I'm told he's dead. He'd been found and he had stab wounds. I just remember going like this straight away and it's gripping. It's a strange pain, it's just... And I still believed at the time, they were talk the police were talking rubbish, there's just no way they're talking about my son. I'm going to say he was no angel, not like that, do you know what I mean? He, he done his little, his bit of naughtiness, as we want to call it then, and he went to jail. But I don't know about that side, that world, I don't know that world. This gang world or this drug world or, or whatever, you know? Within the first week, there was 10 arrests made, but all those people were released on bail. And it's been like that ever since. For any family going through this, whether they've had answers or not, the only thing that I could ever say to them is, it's not that you get over it, because you don't. You don't ever get over it. You get used to how you feel. You do have to keep on living. The smallest of knives can kill someone. It doesn't have to be a massive blade. A lot of these children, I mean, they don't even pay bills anywhere, but you're trying to rep, as they say, rep your area or whatever. 
to prove what to who. You don't own any of it. None of us do. There is multiple things that was done to my son. And for that person to have that information holding, it's got to weigh them down. Whoever these people are, this person is, they're more afraid of that person than maybe their own nightmares. In the first six months of 2018, there have been 1,296 stabbings in London. 64 of those have been fatal. And a large number remain unsolved. Seven people have been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Matthew Kitwande. No one has been charged. Twenty-year-old Lewis Elwin's case remains unsolved and no further arrests have been made. In May 2018, an 18-year-old boy was sentenced to serve 10 years in a detention centre for the attack on Jamel Boyce. <laughs> 